So I am Tamaro Marin Harding. I am Jamaican. I was born in Kingston at Joseph's Hospital, St. Joseph's. 1974, for those who are curious. So next year, I turn 50. Yes. <laughs> You know, life was very easy breezy back then. You know, we did not have the internet. We did not have cell phones. It was very much go out and play and sweat until, you know, romp outside until you get called in. And I just remember my childhood being very much outdoors. And I remember from a very young age being fascinated with nature. And it's a weird, vibe or feeling that I get when I think back to my childhood, it was almost like I knew that this is what I was meant to be, meant to be doing from very early on. Grew up in Barbican and I went to Peter and Paul, since Peter and Paul, and then I left Peter and Paul and went to Andrews. Spent four years at Andrews and that is really where I think I started realizing that I had the creative gene was at Andrews because they had an amazing craft department um, run, run by Mrs. Gooden, and it really sparked something in me. I hated academics at all, like that was not for me. And I'm dyslexic. Not dyslexic where I would see things back ways, but dyslexic where I have a hard time hearing things and then remembering it and regurgitating it. The great part about being dyslexic though is that you learn how to navigate, right? So instead of going from A to B in a straight line, you learn how to go around. We see things spatially. So I can walk into a room and I can redesign the entire room just in my head, right? Without even putting a pen to paper. When I left Andrews, I did two years at Bel Air, did my CXEs there, did exceptionally well. So I got ones in everything, being dyslexic, but how they taught at Bel Air worked for how I process information. It, it, was, it was the best thing that ever happened to me. I got the highest marks in accounting, the highest marks in math. Then after Bel Air, I did an exchange program in Canada for one year. And then I went to college after that in Toronto for two years and studied retail management. I got into, the, got into the college very, very late, and that was the only program that had space. <laughs> and, you know, back then, for my parents, not going to college was not an option. I had to go to college, even if it was something silly like retail management. It was just to be able to say, I went to college. It was a bachelor's degree, right? And then basically just right after that, I, I was gonna go and applied to UFT, but I came back to Jamaica the summer. Um, I reconnected with my now husband and decided that was it. I was not going back to Canada. I was staying in Jamaica. And so that was in 1995. I entered Miss Jamaica that year. And, and that was that. I never went back to Canada. This, so this was summer of 95. And by April 96, I was married and pregnant. So that's why I didn't win Miss Jamaica, because if I had won, I would have had to drop out and it would have been a disgrace, right? I'm now a mother, a wife. Um, I'm, I'm working in our business as a business manager. I had one, one daughter in 96, and then I had my second daughter in 99. Spent my whole 20s raising my kids, 20s and 30s. And then in 2000, we, my husband and I started an advertising agency. It was Agency 27, and we signed on, our very first client was Heineken, and our very first project was Heineken Green Synergy. That was a 78 million Jamaican dollar budget in 2000. And then we, you know, we eventually got into things like social media management, and you know, we shot a tremendous amount of commercials for a bunch of our clients. We did a lot of executions. In fact, then once we signed on Appleton, I personally executed all of their carnival events from, for them. 
separate and apart from Agency 27. So they hired me directly to manage their projects for them. So that was good, and that was a lot of fun. Horrible. <laughs> so working, yes, so working with my husband was definitely challenging. And this was our first time working together, and we fought non-stop. So our brains operate very differently. And my husband does not turn off. So we would literally at 10 o'clock at night be walking into the bedroom and he's like telling me like 15 things we need to do for Lyme for tomorrow morning. So we had to come up with perimeters and, and you know, okay, we're gonna lock off at 7 p.m. and no, talk, no office talk in the bedroom. Like, cause our office, we operated it from home. So we never escaped. So everything was in that one environment. What a lot of people don't know is that Zachary left uh, in 2012 and moved to Orlando to study the finance. I'm two years away from turning 40. I turned 40 in 2014. And I had made up my mind that by 2014, I had to be figuring out what my purpose was in this lifetime. I'm not feeling fulfilled. I know I'm having fun, but I know that this is not my destiny. This marketing and advertising agency is not my destiny because remember, you know, even though it's my own business, I am still working for all the brand managers and all the marketing managers and directors. I have no life. And so sat down with my husband in 2014 of, the, of summer and I said, I got to shut this down because there's no way I'm going to figure out what I'm supposed to be doing if I don't clear the space. And so he said, okay, go ahead. So we wrote to all of the clients and resigned their accounts, shut the agency down. And people ask all the time, why didn't you just get a manager or sell it? It was a very mom and pop hands-on agency and people only wanted us dealing with their accounts. And not just that, when you birth something like that, it's very hard to hand over the baton, you know? And I just felt I needed to just close it down and clear the space. So I went and onto Pinterest, looked to see, you know, what, what kind of Christmas decorations they had and a couple of wood pieces really stuck out. So I pulled all the trees down, went outside, cut down the branches and created these um, stick trees and every one of them sold. People love them. If I could have made a hundred more, they would have sold. And that's what gave me the aha moment that people were really into wood. And I really loved working with wood. About six years prior, I was driving out of Yui and saw a huge massive trunk on the side of the road that JPS had pruned from a tree. I called up Rado and I asked them to help me to cut it up and transport it back to my house. And they did. And I had those pieces drying out at the side of my house for over six years. I had trimmed a pui tree in my house and all of them were rotten on the inside. So I had rather slice them up for me and I had created this huge art piece on my wall. I cannot believe it has taken me this long to figure this out. I mean, the artwork is staring me in the face the wood is right there in the back of my house. And I'm just like, seriously? I didn't need the wood. I, it was just a calling. It was like a calling of, you need to take this tree. I couldn't sleep until I got it, you know. It was, I was fixated on getting this tree. And if you ever see the massive trunk that it was, I have no training. I never went to art school. I have no uncle that's in woodworking, no family member, no nobody, nothing, zero. The money I made from the Christmas trees, I took it to Delta on Hagley Park Road and I bought a small chainsaw, I bought a circular saw and a jigsaw. Didn't know what to do with the circular saw or the jigsaw. I had seen somebody, a carpenter, using them and I thought, okay, those are cool, I can afford them, let me buy them. So that's the three things I started out my business with, with no knowledge. When I got the chainsaw, I went on to YouTube and I taught myself how to turn it on, crank it and start it. <laughs> right? So my husband is like, dear God, please 
No, make her chop off her own foot. I had to teach myself how to carve, but I didn't have any wood to carve with. So I called up a friend who is in construction and I said, just by any chance, have you cut any trees down? He had just cleared a guango tree to make to build a tennis court, sent a truck to pick it up, used the, those now to create, to learn to carve. Decided that the only way to do this was to actually have a launch event. So we decided to launch on my birthday the following year, which was, would have been 2015. So I spent that year learning and creating pieces and then putting the event together. When I launched Marmee Designs, I think I had $2 in my bank account. I was broke, right? And I had, I, I mean, it was so bad. Like I had to beg everybody credit. Tent City, let, you know, gave me credit. PRS is the one that did all the trussing at the back and the lighting for me. Everything was on credit. <laughs> so, thank God, I was able to sell and pay everybody back. But it was a gamble. I got JPS to sponsor me. And then in return, I gave them a table for their lobby. Didn't go without hiccups. I had created these cylindrical lights, but the bulb itself got so hot that it blew. I had two glass tops break, but luckily they both broke, not when people were there, right? So I had some hiccups. I had some hiccups. One table, somebody touched it and it fell over, you know? So, <laughs> but trust me, I didn't know what I was doing, you know? So I'm, I am just like holding my breath, praying that nothing breaks or pops down or... So that was, that was interesting. And then, yeah, and then it, it just, the business just took off from that. Another thing I should mention is in my business plan, I came up with, with this logo, right? And I said, I want to create a stamp and stamp all my pieces, burn all my pieces with the logo. So this brand identity was so powerful because it was so simple. It didn't have a name and it didn't have a number, which was deliberate. It was just, it was meant to be abstract, but it was meant to be so powerful enough that when people saw it, they knew exactly who it belonged to, right? Because it's big M for Mara, little M for Maid, Mara Maid. And it worked. He asked the question about there being no struggles and it being all hunky-dory and, and great. Um, that's not the case, obviously. Remember, I'm learning as I go along. All of the guys that ended up working for me, Rambo, who's still here to this day, was my gardener, right? The other guy was my painter. One of them was just somebody that I met that needed a job. Nobody was trained in woodworking. Nobody. So we were all learning at the same time. So we had some frustrating moments where I knew what I wanted to create, but I didn't know how to execute it. And nobody on my team knew how. To hire a team of trained carpenters would not have worked for the type of work that I was doing. Because everything, first of all, I don't own any equipment to this day. Every single piece I make is using a hand tool, electric hand tool, right? So what that allows us to do is that allows us to not have technical training because we're just using basic hand tools, right? So this was how my dyslexic brain solved that problem. I only work with trees that I call rescued. And what I mean by that is they have to be slated to come down for legitimate reasons. So a lot of them come from construction sites and even that, I tried to convince the contractors to leave some of the trees farming when they're clearing the land to farm. If the tree is dead, already dead, or dropped on its own, fallen on its own, or if it's causing structural damage to a fence or a building, right? So it has to be a legitimate reason why the tree has to come down. Just out of principle, I feel, I felt immediately that my part of my calling was to breathe new life into trees that were unfortunately had to come down. The whole premise for me from before when I got Rada to take up that tree at the side of that road, unknowingly I was rescuing a tree then. When they cut the Pui tree down at my house and I kept it, I was rescuing the tree then. It allows me to breathe new life into that tree that people can now enjoy it for however many years, hopefully for generations to come. As opposed to it being discarded at Riverton, left to rot or burnt. 
all of my profits go back into rescuing trees. So when a contractor calls and says, I have a tree that needs to come down, or somebody, somebody at a residential home or business, I go in and I cut the tree and I clear it at my cost. So it's a very expensive endeavor. People always make the comments, oh, but you get your raw materials for free. <laughs> no, they're not free. They're actually very costly. And what a lot of people don't realize is that once a tree gets cut, it takes years to dry out. It's a labor of love. I don't cut something and then create something with it the following week. I create something with it two years down the road, three years down the road. This table behind me was cut in 2017, right? So that's six years ago. So it's a, it, it's a labor of love. It takes time. There's patience involved in it. But part of my calling is to be able to show how incredible these trees are in its afterlife. I create from what I feel and from what I think that piece should become. And so because of that, no two pieces are ever the same, ever. Even my cheese boards, every single one of my cheese boards, charcuterie boards, I mark it with my hand using a Sharpie marker and then I cut it out with a jigsaw. But a lot of times I create pieces through designers. So I don't know who the end users are. I don't know who the clients are. Don't know where they go. So I went into a house once up in Jack's Hill and I was like, wow, this is so cool. And I'm rubbing my hand on it. And then I see my stamp and I'm like, I made this, <laughs> right? And I'm looking at it and I'm like, wow, how did I even make this? I can't make it again. It was downloaded for that purpose. That wood said, this is what I want to be. I carved, I created it, and I moved on. I can't replicate, I, I could, couldn't even look at it and be like, all right, let me replicate it. I just wouldn't, I don't know how. It came to me in the moment and it left me after. Um, I would say that my style is very earthy and natural and nuanced with the wood in mind. So utilizing the grain movement, if there are any holes or notches or, or anything like that. So earthy would be my first um, adjective to explain my, how, I'm, how I create or what my pieces look like. They're very distinctive though. I mean, you can go into any house or, or business and know, okay, that's her work right off the bat. When I, when I started Marmaid Designs, nobody was doing live edge furniture. Very few people create using only one slab. Most woodworkers do joinery, which I don't do. Most of my pieces are one solid slab. And so it's been an amazing journey to see how that in industry has now taken shape in Jamaica based on all of what was going on with me in starting in 2014, having a, a large presence on Instagram. I was interviewed quite a bit. Um, a lot of the programs, you know, CVM, Small Jamaica, um, Entertainment Report, I did two interviews with them two different times, a lot of newspaper coverage. So it has spawned a whole industry, which I'm extremely proud of. And, you know, people ask me all the time, doesn't that piss you off that people are copying you? No, I think it's great because it's given people an opportunity for them to express their creativity in a medium that maybe they didn't hadn't thought about before, right? And so I'm an open book. Any of them call me, I tell them exactly what to do. In fact, quite a few of them, especially the females, will come and get wood from me if they need it. So yeah, they're competing. We have, you know, we have clients, but there's enough sun to shine on everybody. That's always, that's my motto.